Okay. Hello, everybody. It's six o'clock. We're going to be starting our meeting. Uh, we have a lot of guests here tonight. I just want to remind you that this is a working task force, so we're going to be talking. Um, at the end of the meeting, we'll have an opportunity to have a uh, conversation. But we also are planning to have a low load of community meetings where we we're going to be going out and actively seeking as much community input as we can. So there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to have feedback. There are agendas over there on the table. There's also a sign-up sheet. If you want to be on the email distribution list to get all of the minutes for these meetings, sign up and I will happily add you to that distribution list to see if we can get those, those meeting minutes. Uh, we had a couple of additions to our, our um, operating rules based on the discussion we had last week about values. I've got it up on the, the wall up there. And I just want to read, whoops, and I get even bigger and bigger. So we, we talked about the need, we're actively engaging the community and making the decisions, we're actively working towards building trust in the community, we want to create clarity, so when we're talking about things, it's crystal clear, these are the problems we're talking about, these are the solutions we're offering, and we want to make sure that whatever we do addresses both counts. And uh, with that, the first thing on the agenda tonight is data approach. Where do you want to be? Well, here, I'll sit up here beside you. How about that? I don't want to be standing, then I feel like I'm a podium in some Hilton hotel. Thank goodness there's not a massive crowd after Carla sending me numerous text messages and everything that the sweat was coming off my arm. This is really bad. I thought it was a nice, quiet group. So, some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, David Roach, I have a home inspection company, which also we do a lot of commercial property inspections. And that's sort of where I ended up coming here this evening because I was talking with Kat about some, some things. I'm going to sort of get to there in a minute. I also am involved in quite a bit of property development. Um, a lot of older buildings, we have like large buildings and everything. I've been in the village for 12 years. Um, I must admit, I was on the no vote for the levy side, and I would like to clarify that. I at no time have been against the schools. I am totally for the schools. And if we could actually find maintenance money and building money, I'm all for going for it. But, you know, limited budget when we were looking at it, and I just felt that it was better to vote no at that stage. So that's where I was coming from. Equally, I'd also like to make a comment because it was brought up to me yesterday that I have me have an agenda. No one knows what this agenda is. I certainly don't know what the agenda is. So um, I have no agenda other than just really hating to see the schools spending money on something that would, at the end of the day, put us all in further debt and we'd be back right where we are at the moment. So so that's that's sort of it. Um, so I suppose this whole thing has begun with the schools are falling into disrepair. And um, I'm not criticizing maintenance when we talk about maintenance here. You know, the maintenance guys, I think they probably do an excellent job, but they're doing an excellent job with no money. I mean, 200,000 a year is is so small. When you compare that against what you would spend on your home, which is a fraction of the size with much less expensive equipment in there, 200,000 just doesn't add up. In fact, if you were to multiply out what you would spend in a house over 40 years and then divide it back down to try and get an annual because then you'd be putting away money for roofs and furnaces and everything. You'd be quite surprised how much you're spending. You're nearly spending the cost of the house over that length of time. But a new building at the moment doesn't solve the problem that got us into this problem, which is a lack of maintenance. And a new building will be fine for a couple of years because you know we won't notice the little things breaking on it and then then we'll be into a cycle that immediately with two hundred thousand is, is not going to dig ourselves out and we will have a very large school loan on top of it which means we're going to be in even deeper trouble because we still need the maintenance money i know i sound like a really stuck record on maintenance but i'm a firm believer in maintenance when i'm inspecting homes or businesses that's what I'm inspecting for. Realistically, is a lack of maintenance, which in turn then leaves them with a problem: leaking roofs, um, you know, furnaces that don't work, water heaters leaking, or whatever. Um, 
The reason I'm here is the engineer's report. Kat had some questions and asked me to take a look at it. And it's the one by Fanny and Hilmi, the one where they made the presentation to the school board recently. Um, there's a lot of information in that report. I mean, a huge amount of information. It, it actually just sort of, when you, when you start to read it, it, you just get hit between you know, the, the forehead wondering, where do you even start looking on this? It is something that, that is useful um, you know, as a basis to work from. It really should not be looked at as the Bible that, 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 that needs to be used to get us to where we need to get. And I say that because um, when you look at that, the cost of the repairs is pretty much equal to the cost of a new build. And that is really reading it incorrectly because they're not saying that everything in there has to be done today. It's over a period of years. So it does skew it when you read the total because then you say, well, why don't we just build a new school? We're at 18 versus, I think it was 18 million versus 18 million. But it's not really that. It's actually, you have to look at the maintenance, the daily maintenance, the monthly maintenance, the annual maintenance, and then the money that's put away for roofs and things that only come up every 20 or 30 years. So don't look at it and say, it is an equivalent. If we, if we were to build a school, the school is actually a new building is really going way further than where their report is. The cost of their repairs, if you look at them, appear to be very high. In other words, they're, what, what they're saying it costs for something to be repaired, you can actually get those for way less than what it is. I'm very, very familiar, not with the program they use, but with similar programs that come up with this type of report. Um, it's got a very broad costing base in it, and it's really designed for commercial property sales. So, what, um, in fact, the inspection program I use, if I want, I can click a little button and it would allow me to use it, and then I subscribe to a service that sends me costs. But they don't say Yellow Springs or Dayton. It's, it'll be either sort of North Ohio, South Ohio, Southwest, you know, their, their prices are not really based by going out and asking construction contractors, what are you gonna charge for this? And when people ask me in business, how much would it be to re-roof my house? I could get it for six. I could equally get you one for 11. Do you want a nice truck or do you, or do you want a guy in a, in a dump truck that comes? <laughs> but I mean, that's really quite seriously. Both of them doing excellent work, but with a big difference in price. And that is the problem with looking at all the prices on the report and taking them as fact. They're not fact. It's purely a guideline. Those prices are based on an algorithm that gives you a bottom line when you're buying a big commercial property. So like a Hilton Hotel or something. They want to know they're paying top price and now they want to know what should they really pay for. In other words, how much do they need to deduct off the top price to come to allow for wear and tear? That's really where those figures come from. It's not designed as a true re repair um, program. I was amazed at how these sort of figures are come up with and the way the engineers do it. Because when I started inspections, I'd go out, I'd go down, I'd tell you exactly what's wrong, and then you know, I, I actually turn on the furnace, I turn on the lights, I put a tester in every receptacle, I turn on every faucet, I open every window. And then I went, I decided I really need to up my ante for commercial inspections. So I looked up, there's a big company out of Canada, uh, Carson Dunlap Weldon, they're engineers, they, they're probably one of the biggest consulting and inspection companies in Canada doing home inspections and commercial inspections. And uh, so I headed down to Atlanta, it was a week, it was a 40 hour course, and uh, they go through it. And what amazed me is, you actually don't turn anything on or off. And the first day that we actually go out on site, we went to the, uh, the, the plant room in the Marriott, and 
massive, big, massive boilers and chillers and everything. I'm looking at this going like, I wouldn't even know how to turn this thing on. So I look over at one of the engineers and I go, it's totally different. You know, in the house, I woke up in the thermostat, I turn it on, and, you know, I can determine if it works. And they're like, we don't care. We don't turn them on or off. I'm like, ooh, that's different. Uh, I said, so what exactly are we doing? They said, we go in, we look at it, we determine what age it is, and then we go back, and basically using the algorithm that gives you those, there's a whole thing that goes with it. You look up the age of that particular type boiler, and you come up with a price for replacement. But it's not saying that boiler doesn't work, or does work, it's just you've got X number of years left on it, on average, but as you all know, a lot of people with Ford trucks, you meet two guys and you ask them, do you like your Ford truck? Hey, it, worst truck I ever bought. Breaks down all the time. You ask the other guy and he goes, I got a half a million on it and I don't even change the oil that often. So, you know, furnaces, um, all the components that are in the school are very similar to that. So the figures we've got are great because they give us a baseline of when we should anticipate something going out, but it doesn't mean it will go out at that time. So I read the report and the first thing I, I saw was the water heater, a 40 gallon electric water heater for $5,000. And I thought, ooh, that, that looks a little bit on the high side. I would have thought 750 to nine. So I called out about plumbing and senior. And I just said, electric, 40 gallon water heater, um, how much do you charge to install one? Do you have commercial grade ones? And they said, no, standard water heater. I said, okay, so how much is the standard water heater? $950 installed. I said, well, boy, I thought that was a little expensive, but let's just stick with the 950. You know, 950 is a lot less than 5,000. Um, the stadium fence, the 10 foot high, um, all-star fence, I called them, they were um, 30 bucks a foot, the report said 85 bucks a foot. Um, and in fact, um, it turns out all-star bidded on replacing the fence uh, with the school, I believe, a year ago. They said, they said, are we gonna get this job or not? I said, I'm sorry, I actually don't know. I'm just trying to get price, and I just happened to have called you guys. But you know, there's a difference. The playground fence for, I guess it's for here that was mentioned, the four foot high. You for a second, I just wanna make sure I understand. <clears throat> In the report, did that cost include labor or is it? Yeah. You're, you're saying the 950 was fully installed by Lauderbeck if they were to do that? 950, they take away your old one, okay. they plug in the new one. It's all, all done, completely okay. working. All right, yeah, so. yeah, like for like. And um, the playground fence, four foot high, I called armor fence. They were 13 bucks a, square, uh, a linear foot versus 48 a foot. So, you know, a little bit of difference there. And um, I will say I called Xenia Glass on doors and the doors were exactly what, what were quoted on that. So I think, I think it was two and a bit thousand a door. But um, then I called Jeff Bottom, Bottom Electric. I use Jeff a lot. He does a lot of commercial. He also does a lot of residential. And uh, the first thing on there were that we needed the 800 amp switches changed out, $12,000. And we needed two 800 amp distribution panels changed out, which were $24,000. So I'm like, hmm, seems a lot of money. Never heard of that being changed. So I called him up and I'm like, Jeff, what would you charge to change these out? And he goes, well, I wouldn't change them out. I said, well, the engineer said it should be changed. He said, I have never, ever changed one out. He said, we work in hundreds and hundreds of big buildings. He said, I might change everything after that out, but he said, they're not mechanical. There's nothing to break down in them. You just don't change them out. He said, you just don't change them out. I said, okay. I said, so why would you change them out? He said, they don't fail. So I didn't know why they were marked in there. Then um, they mentioned that we had uh, a lot of 225 amp breaker panels, the 24 circuit ones, and that they should be replaced. So again, I said, what is your price on those? And he said, well, sort of hard to know. He said, I begin off at about, you know, you, you expect everything to be in conduit, you're probably gonna damage some walls and everything doing it. So probably looking at around about 3,500, he said, if it's very difficult, we'd be looking at maybe 4,000, but he said, I wouldn't take out your panels. He said, I just would not replace your panels. And I said, well, they're old panels. They've been in the school a long time. He said, 
As long as the buses have not been, as long as the breakers have not shorted out on the buses and the buses are not damaged, we would just replace all the breakers, which is a very cheap rebuild. Um, I said, well, thinking about it, maybe they're ITE pushbacks, which are sort of bad, they're the bad reputation. I don't believe they're Federal Pacific because I think I would have noticed that walking around the school. But the pushbacks might be there. But if they were pushbacks, he said, oh, well, I'd still just replace him. He said, those, those, are, those are a company called uh, Breaker King, somewhere west of here. And he said, they actually get old pushmatic breakers. They completely clean them. They warranty them. And he said, we just replace all the pushmatics and we'd leave a box of them for the maintenance guy. Big saving in cost. So again, the report has each of those panels in at 5,325, 15 of them. You know, that's, that's, um, that's a lot of money that we're coming up there. there. And then it says that we need a generator for the sprinkler. Well, I don't know if maybe it's a water pressure issue here in Yellow Springs, but generally you don't need a generator for a sprinkler. Um, the sprinklers run off, and I think in, the, in it they mentioned that we need a, a bigger mains. They generally run off the mains. And again, Jeff, who is one of the biggest, uh, they do um, backup generators, and he's one of the biggest installers in Dayton. He said, we've never needed one for a sprinkler system. So unless there's some special reason, there's another 50,000 that would come off the report. And um, the receptacles, the receptacles, you know, the plugs on the wall over there, there's a lot of plugs being mentioned. And the way that the program runs that the engineers did, they would spot check two or three or four receptacles. If they're getting X number bad, then they just sort of multiply that over the whole school of how many is needed, which may or may not be the best way of doing it. But they have in that it's $250 a receptacle to change out, which is $80,000 for all the ones they feel should be changed out. Well, Jeff said he would be more than happy. In fact, he'd give a 50% discount and still be happy to come because the most he'd charge would be $14 a receptacle. And that would be using an upgraded 20 amp actual plug there. So just a lot of little questions on what we've got. There's a question of getting rid of the hazardous materials, $372,925. So there's three different categories they've been there. They've known, assumed, and suspected. Well, if it's been looked at for the last four or five or six years, because it seemed that they said that it was a known thing, then it, it should not be anything other than known because we shouldn't have suspected at this stage. We should already know what we're dealing with. Assumed is never good. So if this is something that's a big deal, we should actually get someone to look at it and say, we got this amount, period. It might be way less than that. So the report makes it appear that we cannot afford to rehab the building when you just read down. But with the prices what they are, it would appear to me that you could probably, first of all, you'd be taking off the long-term maintenance and taking that away. Then you'd be going down to the stuff that needs to be, maybe I think it was category one and category two. And then you would find out what, you know, you would maybe take 30 or 40% off that to start seeing where is a realistic figure for what we need to be spending on the buildings. What we really need to do is, is to focus on these buildings as assets. Forget calling them the school, forget calling them anything else. They're actually assets. They have been paid for. It's something we actually don't have to put money out to get another one of them. So can we improve it? Can we improve those buildings? Can we actually make them better? Can we make them grow with us? In other words, you know, They'll never be, even a new school will not be what we want in three years time or five years time because everything changes. The internet gets faster, the classes get smaller, the way of teaching gets, gets revolutionized by, by something else that's suddenly being discovered. So even a new school will still have to grow with us. So why not maybe grow with the old one as we rehab it. As we rehab it, we can rehab it to what is the end thing for that year. So 
it also is a huge value to a cash-strapped village, which is what we are, whether we like it or not. We are very cash-strapped. We do not have enough large corporations in the village. Pumping cash in here. Uh, you know, more houses, if you even did the math of, if you put in a multi-unit development where the school is here, and you had 60 or 70,000 houses, the amount of money to the school is still fairly small. It really needs massive revenue flows if you're going to need big, big money, which you would need for a new building. So maintenance and improvements should not be considered a one-day job. It shouldn't even be considered something that we do today to fix it. It should always be ongoing. So the maintenance, everyone needs to start thinking about things in a in a totally different format. Maintenance is not something to fix something that breaks. It's something that's fixing things that's breaking. It's repairing things that are looking dingy. It's, it's looking at things that are worn out and saying, let's program this when this summer, when, when the school is closed. It's painting it every year. It's an ongoing thing, just like you do with your house, with your car, with your garden. So what we really need to be is at this stage, and this I think is why you've got the committee and you're all here, is you need to be reactive because you've got a problem and you have to react to that. But what you need to do is you need to work towards being proactive. So the reactive is to get working on it and say, okay, this is what we need to fix right now. And then once you get that, then you need to be proactive. You watch those things and don't let them become what they were. In other words, you don't want things to wear out totally before you get rid of them. Fanning Honey did state that the current buildings, when he was standing right there looking, answering some question about building new schools, he did say that the buildings we have are actually better built as far as the amount of concrete block and hard surface in them that is hard to wear out. And I mean, schools and prisons are very similar. They take a lot of abuse, a lot of wear, a lot of people moving through. Yeah, so a well-built place, which we have, is something we can work with. So I did go to one of the, uh, of the focus groups that was being held. And it was interesting listening to what people did not like in the school. So when I go to the school, I'm thinking roofs, boilers, windows, electrical. But it did seem like a lot of the people in the focus group said that it wasn't pretty. It just wasn't a nice school. It doesn't look good, not comfortable. And this is really good news for a focus group like this and for a group that's trying to sort of include the village back into being, you know, that wants to do something for the school. Because it's easy to make something ugly pretty again. I remember one time listening to a, uh, a TV show and it was, uh, uh, what was his name? Baker, Tammy Faye Baker. Oh, yeah. Tammy Faye Baker <laughs> has been interviewed about why her marriage had lasted so long. And she said, because Jim thinks I'm beautiful and he's never seen me without my makeup on. And she would wait for him to go to sleep at night before she took her makeup off. And she would wake up before him and put it back on again. This is not good relationship advice, I feel like it is. <laughs> the school is really very similar, you know. It's 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 looks is what we're dealing with. And a lot of the a lot of what we've got there is cosmetic, which is easy to rectify. You know, you paint desks, all that type of thing. And I'll sort of come back to that in a little while. <clears throat> Equally last year, at the before the vote came in, there was a lot of I think sort of hearsay that was going on that got people very upset about the schools. One of them was this horrific crack, the crack upstairs. I mean, this crack had grown to proportions you know, equivalent to the Grand Canyon. And when I went and looked at this crack, um, I thought, it looks to me like just a regular expansion joint. And then they got, and I don't know, I can't remember the name of the engineer. You might remember the engineers from Dayton. Uh, Shelmeyer. Shelmeyer. 
they came out and they looked and they said, it's an expansion joint that the chair legs have sat on thousands of times and just pushed, pushed the joint down into the gap. Expansion joints are normal. They just need to be refilled. It's not something that makes the school a bad school. So a lot of these things sort of happen like, like that. The shoebox, so the shoebox annoys the heck out of everyone in the village. In fact, most people think shoebox, they go demolish it, just get rid of it. Yet the same engineers did get down in the crawl space. We had to sort of, I think you pushed and I pulled and they got down and took a look. And actually they were, they were very good quality prefab units that were bought. There was no damp down there. There was no rust on any of the beams. They were very, very well supported. And they're completely encapsulated in a building. So they are getting no weather from the outside. Even if we don't like those nasty shoe boxes, as everyone says, um, they, they're still a valuable commodity in the school because there's a lot of things the school needs. I can just think of a few. Storage, study rooms, offices. There's a whole lot of things that they can be reused for, which are way lower density than classrooms. So why throw them away? Maybe if in 10 years time or 15 years, we built everything else around it and there's cash still flowing in, maybe someone says, we need new storage rooms. But for the moment, they're an asset. So that's the way to look at it. And I'm not saying that they're brilliant. I'm just saying it's a usable space. Equally, I, I know um, at the presentation we, we had here a couple of weeks ago, they mentioned that you know the average life of these are one to three years. I find that a little bit hard hard to uh, to believe because surely uh, most companies making them would go out of business fairly quickly because who would who would buy them when they fall apart within three years? I mean, you see old versions of those on building sites that are way more than three years old. So, where do we begin? Like. Where, where do you begin now? You've sort of listened to me blather on for plenty of time. Uh -huh. And the first thing we've got to do is you've got to make people in the village happy. You've just got to make them happy. You've got to make them happy. Coming to school, if they're happy coming to school, they'll pay for it. It's very much like a restaurant. If, if people go there and they like the food, they like what it looks like, they'll pay the bill. Lots of people, it amazes me who are on you know, incomes that I do not feel, you know, would have them going to a certain restaurant will tell me that we eat in the winds all the time or something like that. And I go, really? Oh, love that food. It's just so good. You know, and it doesn't matter whether it is the best food or not. If it's perceived value, then they pay for it. And that's what the school needs to have. It needs to have a perceived value. And to do that, you know, you've got paint. It's really easy to change the colors. I think the colors are drab. I've got nothing against the blue and white. But maybe the blue and white could be toned down and still be in areas, you know, where there are bulldogs or something like that. But give warmer, cozier colors somewhere else. The desks, they're probably not the most comfortable desks. They're definitely well, well worn. They're probably even a little bit small if people are trying to use electronics and paper at the top of them. New desks. Way less than building a new building. The exterior, those panels, even if we couldn't afford to change out the panels at the moment on the outside, could we afford to get someone to paint them a different color in the meantime and then put them onto a program where we say, okay, six years down the road, we'll have money for those panels. But in the meantime, let's at least give them a facelift. So I think. A lot of that is stuff that you could be looking at in your committee that does not cost a lot of money. And, you know, work towards, I know um, they were talking about the plumbing backs up all the time in the toilets, you know, massive cost. But has anyone actually put a scope down those drain pipes to find out? They're probably cast iron drain pipes because it's a, you know, a mid fifties building. But is it just one tree root? Is it just one piece of broken pipe? Or is it a perfectly good pipe that, I mean, we are a school with a lot of girls. Have we had a lot of sanitary products going down there? And you know, the pipe's blocked. It happens. It's just the nature of any large building. We'll just so, them down hmm? 
was oh, also yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just to be fair just yeah. to be accurate yeah and, and i mean boys will drop tennis balls and everything else down so paper yeah. towels yeah yeah, yeah. And, but I just said that because when I did call a drain company and ask them, so I said, if we did have, let's say, a 20-foot piece of drain under the parking lot that is broken, a cast iron pipe, and we need it replaced, how much money are we talking about? And uh, with asphalt repair, $5,000. I have the name of who that was here in a minute. But, um, you know, there's also other things people want. They want, uh, you know, new kitchen, you know, you could be thinking about a new kitchen, you could be thinking about a security vest of you, you could be, which really are not actually that secure. No one's using bulletproof glass. People can probably come in the back doors of the school anyway. So, you know, security vest of you, how much money do you want to spend on it? But they're all things you could be looking at and working towards. They don't have to be in there today. So when you're thinking of maintenance, you need to break it out using again probably those charts and you're going to have the uh, three year five year ten year or whatever you decide sort of works for you in your flow chart and your cash income and um, one of the things that they they have a lot of lines uh, written into is re replacing the lighting in the school that would certainly brighten up all the classrooms and that would be an instantaneous saving. So that would bring down your utility bills fairly quickly, which would be, which at least would be a payback. So the, you know, so the faster you do it, the more money you're going to make back on. What you need to do is have a nice, welcoming place for those students. Would you ever go back to a to a to a vacation resort or a hotel that isn't nice? No. You're going to tell all your friends don't care. Unfortunately, the kids can't tell the other kids don't go to school. So it's the parents who get the brunt of it if the kids are unhappy. Make them happy. It was, um, I called up Sturgill uh, Roofing, and uh, they're a large commercial roofer. They do a lot of, um, they do a lot of school, churches, hotels. They just finished doing Guiana schools. I think there were 14 buildings. Um, their pricing, uh, his high-end price for redoing our roofs, and we're stripping completely off and beginning again, and then putting on rubber roof on the whole thing. The highest it would come out would be 15 bucks a square foot, which is exactly what the engineers have in that. He was very concerned there might be a lot of a lot of pipes, vents, and lift shafts, and everything. I said honestly, there's not a lot of that. So. That 15 would more than likely be less than that, probably somewhere down around about 12. So in a million dollars, that's still a good amount of money off there. He did mention, I was talking with Justin there, and he did mention that what they are doing for a lot of school districts, and they charge for it, he said it would be probably around about $1,000. But they will come out, go over all the roofs, measure everything, and say, this roof, you're going to need to do this sort of maintenance in a year and a half's time. This building, it's good for five years. This one's good for seven. That one's good for 10. This one, we'd have to do way more work repairing it. That one, way less repairing it, replacing it, or whatever. He said, that at least gives you a real figure. It's actually a contractor is saying, I can do this work for this price, which is better than going with the engineer's figures because their figures that you actually have in writing. And the other one you said was based on programs. So this one is based on real, real estimates. Yeah, yeah, real estimates. What I think you might want to consider would be to get a project manager. So after you're all finished, that you actually get a project manager. Maybe someone who's retired, they would be part volunteer, part paid. And they would use your list of things. And instead of just saying, let's call in the two electricians we normally get, they would actually write up exactly what you're looking for. And they would go out and they would talk to different companies, try and find who are the best three matches, and then get quotes from them, rather than just throwing darts out to the place everyone normally uses. Maybe even go as far as Columbus or somewhere. But to take a whole new approach as to how you do it. They would not be in charge of maintenance. They'd just be like your procurement agent. And then they would go back to you and say, this is what we've come up with. But that might be a way of getting better prices. You know, they put way more effort into it than 
the maintenance guy is going to be able to. I mean, the maintenance guy is the maintenance guy. He's there, you know, two guys, two hundred, you know, two hundred thousand dollars. He's got to make them go a long way. So, doing that, you're going to get real figures. You're going to know what you really need to do and what you really don't need to do. Because equally, when that electrician or that roofer or that glazier or that plumber comes, he's going to say. I really don't need to do that. Like for instance, in the report, it says replace all the galvanized piping with copper. I don't know why you replace it with copper. It's very expensive to put in. It's very slow to put in when you're trying to put it into an old building. Why not run PEX? Unless there's a, a code reason that says you can't run PEX. PEX comes off a big roll, you pull it fast. It doesn't leak, you have very few joints. You know, try and save another few bucks wherever you can. And for brickwork in the report, this is 870,000 for brickwork, caulking, flashing. There's not a whole lot wrong with that exterior from what I know. So I called up uh, Marsden's Masonry, spoke with Fred, they're a big company, they do a lot of stuff. They just finished doing um, a church down in Washington Courthouse. And I said to him, so give me an idea of cost. He goes, yeah. I don't know what you want fixed. I said, I don't know what they want fixed either, but I just want to know how much does it cost to fix it? So I said, let's assume you could do all the caulking, some tuck pointing, some new flashing, a bunch of painting of lintels. There's probably a bit of lintel lift somewhere. So fix that as well. I said, let's just say it took you and a bunch of guys a month. How much would you charge us? He said, well, we just had a whole team working down in Washington courthouse. We were four weeks there. $32,000, $32,000, that's a lot versus, you know, I'm not saying the 870 doesn't have other stuff in it, but we need to keep it all in, in focus of where we're going. So using what we have, we're working towards improving what we've got, improving the facilities. We need to catch up on delayed maintenance. <coughs> And we probably need to have project-based improvements. I mean, if we've got project-based learning, why don't we have project-based improvements? <laughs> In other words, when you're looking at some things, maybe not get all of that item done as the immediate repair and say, we can hold off on these other things because we could, we could actually just, you know, we're not going to replumb the kitchen because we have the kitchen set for three years time to rebuild so we'll save the money on that and then we'll we'll do that plumbing later so you you look at what projects you're going to do and you and you would not do any work in that area until you get it unless it's a safety item of course with a group like this it's really easy sometimes to keep talking in on yourselves but if you're out and about or you're watching TV and something hits you like a lightning bolt of that this could be an idea we could use, you should think about it. It might even be a story about ants in their little cave or something like that or their tunnels. But you need to think outside the box. It's too easy to get stuck. Reading the engineer's report, you keep going down, you just the sweat runs off you and you go, we need to get all this done this way. But some parts of what they have is get rid of it. Maybe get rid of it's the right thing to do, but maybe repair it, maybe enlarge it, maybe make it two-story, but think outside the box when you're talking to each other and throw around your comments because everything you say fires off another thought pattern. And I don't think anyone designing a building, if you have a bunch of architects, you generally don't have you know, it's not one guy working on your school building and he works away with his pencil and you keep sharp and you're working on it. They'll have groups, they'll, have, they'll sit around and they'll look at it and they'll go, Mike, that is the worst drawing I've ever seen. My golly, you know, look where your windows are. Look where your doors are. That window is looking straight into the restroom. <laughs> you know, so you need to throw out your ideas between you and work on them. And, and no idea is a bad idea. It's just maybe not one that gets used. Or maybe it's one that fires off an idea that someone else uses and says, you know, that solves all your problems. So, the other thing you might think about is if you have, let's just say there's money in there now for replacing a roof in five years. So, if you need, if you need money for a project in a year and a half's time, maybe you can borrow that and then 
you'd make three equal payments back over the next three years. It does mean you can't do a whole lot more for those three years, but you might be able to self-fund some of your projects as long as you don't, don't program that money out past what it's needed for. But just something you might be able to talk to the village about, or not the village, but the school board about. Um, do small remodels rather than borrowing. You know, no loans that you make. If you do have to borrow money, try and keep your loans down to like a five-year loan because otherwise you've forgotten why you ever borrowed it. No one in the village can nearly tell you why we have a school loan. You have to explain it to them. You know, it's gone. They don't even care anymore. They just know the school isn't a, isn't a happy place anymore. It's not all cozy and lovely colors. So try and keep loans short and... Um, you know, and then we talked about the shoebox and everything. The music room, for instance. You know, we've got a new music room come in there. I, uh, when Mario was, there was a couple of different people doing tours, and I just happened to be able with Mario. And when we went into the music room, the music professor was saying, it is the best music room that he knows in the whole state of Ohio. The best sound. And he said he is the only music teacher he knows who does not have tinnitus. So... There's a music room we should be keeping or working on. Now, it may not be the prettiest outside, but you know, that's easy to fix. I know he's got a storage issue, but a storage room would be way less expensive to build than a whole new music room. So, so there, so that was it there. Bathroom, okay. So when you're looking at your maintenance, you should really, start trying to categorize, going through the things that the engineers have come up with, and then maybe things that will just come to mind yourselves. So you day-to-day -day maintenance, that'll be your thing. That's where someone goes to use the bathroom and the doorknob's missing, day-to-day -day maintenance. You need to go back and get it. You know, one of the push bars on one of the doors isn't working. You know, emergency lights are not coming on. Stuff that just happens just because. Those are day to day. Then you're going to have sort of annual maintenance. That would be like you're repainting during the summer vacation. You're going to have, um, I don't know, there'll be just just those sort of things that 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 happen. You want to break out things from their from their list into that. Then you're going to have long term maintenance, which will be like your roof, HVAC, parking lot. So you'll be able to start then saying, okay, we only need this amount of money for here, this amount because. If you're getting, let's say, a million dollars in every year, you can't afford to spend all that million this year. You have to put money aside for those things that are going to happen in, in 10 or 15 or 20 years. Because if in 10 years' time you're going to have to spend a million on a roof, then you have to put 100000 aside every year for that roof. Because if it was a million today, remember, there's going to be inflation. So hopefully the interest maybe pays off some of that inflation. Then you're going to have planned projects. So you're going to have things like plan crook. It might be um, to build on a new classroom. It might be new bathrooms. You could have the kitchen. These type of things are planned projects. So then you'd have to decide which one are you going to do first because you can only do so many out of the cash you're bringing in. Then you would also have mandated upgrades. You're going to need money for that. So you need to start thinking of that. So if there's an ADA regulation, the state says you have to have different fire signs or something in a school. I know one or two places in the engineer's report, they say bring up to code. And I've got a big issue with them using that word code there because that gets everyone excited. So first of all, code is the minimum standard for habitability. And I love when a builder says it's built to code. That's just great. Because if it wasn't, even the dog could live in here. It's the minimum standard. You cannot get an occupancy permit if you build it less than code. But you can go better than code anytime you want. Code applies the day that it's been built. So something that, and as soon as something is built, the code book's already changing. In fact, by that time you've already moved in, the code book has generally long changed. So your building is technically not to code anymore. So like the handrails and things on the stairs, they're, they are not to today's code. We have no idea what they were when it was built, but we assume they were to the code at the time it was built. So that should be brought up as a safety item, not a code item. Just it's semantics, but it's just it is a different it is a different category. 
So if everything had been juggled and looked after and maintained the way we're talking, where you would have all these classifications of what you're doing for your maintenance, we wouldn't have this problem. We could all go down to the brewery and just drink a beer or something because the school would be in fantastic shape. The, de the problem we've got didn't happen in a day. It didn't develop in a day. It's taken 20 or 30 years of, I won't say mismanagement, but a lack of foresight and a lack of just general knowledge of what they were dealing with. And now you've got a group of people who are all fired up and getting into it. So you're actually going to save the school at the end of the day. But you can't cure it all overnight. So you needn't feel overwhelmed when you say, we can't do this this year. We're going to have to wait two years or three years. Even if we built a new school, look at the fire station. It's already, I think, year two, and they haven't even got a building yet. So, you know, it might even take five years to get a new school. In five years, we could be well ahead of where we are with today's school. So you're going to have, you know, real tidy up stuff is what you're going to aim for for the, for the next two years. And by the time four to five years comes, I think if you get a decent amount of money coming in, you're going to see a huge change in the school because you'll be nibbling away at it. It's like doing a little bit of work in your yard every day. The flower bed doesn't look good the first day, doesn't look good the second day. The week or two later, your neighbor says, wow, that's looking really nice. And then you realize you're making progress, little steps. The other thing you need to look at is, and this is something to keep in your mind all the time, is it's not what you want in the school, it's what you need in the school. And there's a big difference between need and want. We all want a really nice car, lots more horsepower, more comfortable seats. But what do we need? We just need something to get us from A to B. So if we don't have the money for the Ferrari, we shouldn't be buying one. We should be looking at maintaining the Ford Escort and going along happily. An interesting thing to just um, look at is probably the two wealthiest school districts in our area are Oakwood and uh, Centerville. And neither Oakwood or Centerville are building any new schools. And um, Oakwood has just done a whole bunch of um, updating. Centerville has superbly well maintained schools. They've got a very, very large maintenance crew. The teachers, Everly have um, in their staff room or somewhere, they have like uh, little coupons. And if something breaks in their classroom, they write it down and it is literally fixed before the next time they come back into the classroom. Their schools are in excellent condition. And they didn't get there just by chance. They got there because, the, because people in Centerville paid for it. That's, we will be going to that in a second. Because that's what this is all about. It's all about money. And at the end of the day, you guys are all going to dis discover that it doesn't matter what the engineer says, it doesn't matter what architects say, it boils down to money. And that's where I think the cell gets a whole lot harder. <clears throat> How much is really needed? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a guy who puts money on things. But on the back of an envelope, I would say that the minimum needed for your maintenance, just the minimum. And I'm not talking like janitorial, you know, I'm not talking the guy cleaning the floors. I'm not talking cutting the grass. I'm talking real maintenance. The minimum is probably somewhere around a million a year. If we were in a really wealthy area, I'd be probably throwing a dart for something way higher than that. Because the money you're taking in, it has to do all these various things. It actually is supposed to be rebuilding the school slowly as it sort of needs to transform. And then maybe like that theater you have planned there, maybe it takes a while, but there should be money coming in to do that. That should be a goal in what's being collected annually. And that'll be part of what you guys are all working at. It needs a lot of money to run a school. So spending, you know, it, it, it needs to be completely recalled how it's spent. I know that about a year and a half ago, um, 
Mario mentioned that they needed air conditioning here in Mills Law. And I had Warner Mechanic Letter Beaver Creek come out and give them an estimate for mini splits. Mini split the whole place. Give, every, give everyone air conditioning, $110,000. And Mario said, no. He, had, he wanted to go with the standard system like this, big plant, a million one to do it. And his reason was the mini splits would only last 14 years and they would cost too much to run. Well, 14 years, that's debatable. You'd probably get a little bit more out of that. But let's just say, let's just assume they even all died at 14 years. At 110,000, let's just buy another whole set in 14 years. Because the big, the big piece of plant equipment, it probably is only programmed to last about 20 years. So, you know, it doesn't all have to be big stuff. Maybe we do need to start looking at using some more residential builders for small building job rather than bringing in big, big commercial ones who are going to charge way more. They're going to be a union labor versus a non-union labor. Um, So with all the talk of affordability in the village, residents sort of forget that the schools bring a huge value to homes. And I don't know, you know if this is something you can sell, but it is something to keep in the back of your mind, that having a really good school district brings people into the village, and it ups the value of, of homes, which does not help the affordable, <laughs> affordable argument. But it, it's better than having the home values going down, which means there'll be even less money for education. And a good, a good school system brings people in who want to go to the schools. So when you look at where, I mean, it's quite funny. In Oakwood, when the, when the eldest, when, when people who want, to, who want to move homes in Oakwood, probably 50% of the houses in Oakwood do not go on the market when they sell. Someone who has a kid in first grade wants a bigger house. They look at what kids, what families have their last kid in school. They go around knocking on the doors. And it's like, are you leaving at the end of the year? And they're like, yeah, we are. Our, our kids getting out of school, we'll be moving. That's why we're in Oakwood. And you know, that is something to keep in the back of your mind. The better the schools are, the more money that the schools will actually get from property tax. So, you know, your choices here are limited. It's new build or rehab. The maintenance figure needs to be dramatically increased. I mean, just dramatically increased. If the maintenance figure cannot be increased, then you really just, just need to close down. I mean, there would be possibly dropping being an exempted school district would bring in some more money. I don't think it would probably bring in nearly enough. And then the, the other suggestion would be that you actually just close down the schools completely and you bus everyone to another school district. But I don't think anyone actually wants that. But this is really a money issue. You, you cannot have your cake and eat it. The village, not you guys, the village cannot have its cake and eat it. So it's, it's, you're in a really, really rough bind because you need a lot of money to do what you need to do. That sort of looks me out, and I don't know if I've used up all my time or been over my time, but. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, but I am really grateful. I appreciate you all inviting me here. I, I hope I've given you some little bit of something to sort of jog your minds or maybe get you going. It's a monstrous undertaking that you've been tasked with. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think you, you really need to break it down into you know groups of maintenance and then just focus on each one as smaller groups and not be awed by how large an undertaking it is. Um, you know, you're working with an inherited issue, which you know is gonna be a very hard pill for the village to swallow when you eventually you know come out with whatever it is. But if you if you don't solve this, it can only get worse. It it, it won't get better on its own. And, uh, so that's I think I run out of. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, I have a question. Um, first of all, I appreciate your 
compassionate and just reminded us and really engaged in this process and helping us see things from a different perspective. Um, when you talk about a million dollars should be budgeted for maintenance, do you mean to compare that to the 200000 that we currently spend annually on maintenance? Yeah. So we should increase it to that extent. And I mean, really, really what you what, what you really need, what it really needs to do is become a huge piece of that. And you need to figure out, you know, what are the roof, what's the cost of the roof, you know, and, and, and take the minimum length of time, which would be, let's say, let's say 20 years. In fact, some school roofs only do 15. A rubber roof with a bit of patching, you'll probably keep it going to 20 as well. But, you know, sort of take different things and then, and then you have to start collecting them. So if it's, you know, if it's a million for the roof, then you need 100,000 every year. Or what do you need, 500,000, yeah, 500,000. 50,000 every year. <laughs> I'm getting all those zeros. But you need 50,000 every year just for the roofs that just goes away into a, into a savings account. And you have to do the same thing with, with all your big plant and equipment. And then you should be doing the same thing for all the desks, the same thing for, you know, maybe, maybe for projectors and everything, you should be putting, that might be only 20 or 30 bucks every, every month or something. You know, equally, I'm thinking out of the box. There's a lot of money in there for wiring for internet and everything. But wiring for internet? Who wires for internet anymore? You know, why is it not just just do wireless? Save save all the wiring costs. <coughs> um, you know, wiring is obsolete. It's probably just about as quick as you put it in. And the wireless will be obsolete as well. It's like like your your iPhone. You buy a new iPhone and you're happy with it for a month, and then they tell you. <coughs> Uh, that they got the new model coming in. You need the bigger one. But the old one will still do the job as long as you maintain it. You might have to put new batteries in it, a new screen on it, buy a new case. That's exactly the same as, as here. So, uh, so there are standard ways of moving things. You talked about moving maintenance tasks. Is there a standard for that? Uh, or do we come up with You're going to have to sort of look, and, look at, and, and really break that all down and, and try and put, put cash figures on everything. And you could use you could use their their figures roughly um, and then try and get some estimates for some of them. You know, just like I did just on, on ballpark estimates. And then even use those to start doing the math. It would at least it would at least start you working in a way. And then if there's a building project, well, there you've got an architect and he can give you ideas of what it would cost to do that or this remodel or that remodel and you'd say, okay, well Wow, at that amount, I don't think we can do that for five years. So in five years, we need to collect this amount of money each year. We, if we have four of those projects, then you know, it'll be 20 years before we get them all finished. But hey, let's start working on them and knock them out one by one. And if everyone knows they're going to get this in the village, then at least they know that there's something happening. They actually, you know, they can, they, they can feel happy with what they're, they're paying into. Questions? Thanks. I have a question. Nice share, my dad. <laughs> Thanks, David. You gave us confirmation of some of the things we talked about, and you gave us some new ideas of ways to approach this, which are fabulous, right? Because you're right, this is, this is a huger task than any of us thought when we started. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, you know, while, while maybe all the figures and everything are, are not good to use as a final figure in the engineer's report. I think you can really use that chopped up. I mean, you know, maybe someone can actually just take big boards and print those out and chop them up, you know, and you can, you can stick them on, you know, different grouping boards and actually start sort of breaking them That's out of it, yeah. into something you can use there. And then you kind of, kind of base that as the Excel spreadsheets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the problem is, is that when we're talking this amount of money, that's only covering the school up there. You got another one down here. I mean, that well, needs to be. Did, we had estimates for both schools. Yeah. So, so we do have that. To know yeah. Estimates. Yeah, but like, like, you know, when I'm talking, you, you probably realistically need a million. You, you probably need another figure. Because what you're talking about, a million is what you're talking about. Yeah, and you know, I mean, schools are expensive. And, it, and if they had been, you know, if more money had been put in over the last 20 years, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be looking for even a fraction of this, unless you wanted to go ahead and just build a new stadium or a new concert hall or something else that would be an add-on to it. But 
know, at the moment, you're playing catch up. It is a big game of catch up. You know, can I have your notes or can I have a copy of your notes? Oh, yeah. You can have them. Thank you. The question is, will you be able to read them? Oh, yes. I, I, <laughs> he, he has got really gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Right? Actually, that's not my handwriting. That's why I'm being really careful when I'm writing, writing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. So I'll give you those. I'll actually give you that. They, they were those. And, and, and this was actually with the, the other engineers last year walking through the school. Just so it knows that I've got it down. Yeah. 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 Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, if people wanted to take off, now they've heard what David had to say, you're welcome to take off. If you want to stick around for the whole meeting, you're welcome to do that as well. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll let you all discuss it in private then. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the brain's full again. So, so what I'm going to recommend right now, because that is a lot, we are going to see other things. We have some other things we want to talk about tonight. Yes, if I can get all the notes back to you, we can talk about this further in July, so you have a chance to think about it. Does that make sense to you? But I'm not sure if there's if there's immediate things people want to say. I'm happy to hear, but I'm kind of thinking we need some more information time on that. Yeah, I think we can still talk. It's fresh in our heads, right? That's right. And I think a lot of us did. Well, I did a little bit of work. <laughs> uh, I think some folks did more. So I think it's all in our head now. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not against clearly we're not making any decisions today, but I don't think there's a problem with us no talking worries. about it. Yeah. I mean, wasn't what we were going to do go over the Fanning Howie? Um, we were. We had a couple of things. Also, sort of feel like at the at least the monetary um, estimates. Yeah. Are potentially off. Yeah. I, I felt that a while ago. Did I, you? I was like, okay. Okay. How much? I think yeah. they. Uh, I think they blew some of that out. Well, and again, it's a rough order of magnitude. And he, he said they use a it's hard average, yeah. you know, it's a big average. You know, and average. he's right, when you execute, you're gonna execute to cost, you know, better cost estimates. Mm -hmm. But it's a great I, I think he, he confirmed that it's a good way of thinking about the problem. Right. It may yes. not be right, but it's yes. a good start starting. Yes. Yeah, when he was saying um we call the spreadsheet, I didn't think about that somewhere along the line that um we could for example, take this and do using the Excel tools of hide and unhide. Go through and just have here's all of the um, critical items. Mm -hmm. Just have all those in one place, and then here's all of the priority items, and have all those in one place, so that we have a way again to look at it that is smaller as opposed to this massive number of things. Would you still separate them by category, like site and architectural? Well, I, I could put them all in one spreadsheet, but just make sure that we have oh, separation. Okay. Separate them on that. That says, yeah, here's the, here's the, the um, building stuff, and here's the HVAC stuff. Mm -hmm. I personally thought that, you know, since I am absolutely obsessed with the idea that students don't want to use the bathrooms, <laughs> it makes me crazy. Um, the idea of doing the scoping on the plumbing as a way to find yeah. out what the real issues are. That, that seemed to me to make just a ton of sense. And do we know that it hasn't been done? Yeah, Mike or, or TJ, has that been done? I believe it has, but yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Um, it's a mystery? Is that a uh, scope that they couldn't figure it out? Or? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I know they've had issues and they've you know, worked with trying to figure out what the problem was, so I would assume that would be part of it. But I don't know. If I could just say, inviting, I uh, wanted to invite David here. Um, talking with him last year when the levy was trying to be passed, mm -hmm. we talked through this, and it's clear he has a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking as I was reading through this, I know not what I'm looking at, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have any basis mm -hmm. to gauge whether this is real and what to question and how to question it. Right. And so Chad and I met with David last week, and we're talking about it, and my jaw was on the table the whole time. Right. Mm -hmm. We have, I mean, I, I don't want to insult anybody here, but. Collectively or individually, we don't have the capacity to understand it. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> right. well, I said, you do not insult me at all. <laughs> As he was talking, the first thing I wrote down, and I just showed to you, Desiree, was project manager. And I looked over at you, TJ. I don't know if we were kind of the same thing, but 
you know, something awesome and undertaking like that. Um, I'm going to ask that we just take kind of a funny moment. I found the dedication program, I'm always good for one, from October 27th, 1963 at the Elvis Springs High School and the expenditures. So when you lose your time, take a look at how much was spent because it's broken down. Uh, the okay. original building yeah, of the Yeah, school. the original building. So I told um, Mel, so 56 years ago, you passed, passed one. It was just interesting just looking at the breakdown, the community contributions. Um, so just take kind of a gander, just kind of baseline data from where we were 56 years ago when we built the high school. So, oh, yeah. so Kat, I think I cut you off. That's okay. Thanks for the, the little, uh, you know. So really my first thought was where are we going to get that guy that he, or gal oh, that he right. was okay. describing who had that. Right. Expertise and it was about to retire and would yeah. maybe volunteer <laughs> half right. their time. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there's about 10 of those waiting in line. There might be, <laughs> and that might be a viable thing. And I'm going to throw this out to the group here. Is it too late in the process to invite David to join this? That's not my decision. I don't have a lot of work. It's not my decision either. Yeah. You know, is, is that something? TJ that, and Terry? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the, the question is is it uh, appropriate to invite David who has knowledge of what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what my leeway is to speak here, so and I can't say whether it's appropriate or not. I guess I think talking about this is great, but I just want to put it out there. I, I appreciate the, um, in his words, out of the box approach, mm -hmm. but I do want to say I, I feel like there are some inconsistencies and perhaps erroneous statements that, that it's important that we all understand. And I'm just going to say I'm not a contractor or a, anything like that. I'm an educator. But I do know a little bit about this because I've been through this process before. And so one example of the technology infrastructure and why would we need to run wires? Well, things don't happen by accident. So we can all sit in here and log on wirelessly, and it's as if a miracle occurs. But that device right there is connected to some pretty sophisticated cables that have to run all over. So it is not free. So I, I understand his thinking and that we need to think outside of the box, but I also think it's important that we, that we really deal with accurate, factual, pieces. I appreciate the time you took to call folks and to get other prices, but I also know, again, having been in the middle of it, there are certain requirements that schools must meet, period. It's not what you or I need to meet as a homeowner. It might not even be what a business needs to meet. So I think all of those things provide some different levels of context when you look at Pricing, I don't know if Fanning House pricing is high or low. I just know that schools, unfortunately for us, because we have to pay for it, are, are held often to, to different standards. Would you agree with the uh, maintenance argument, though, that we really need to budget a lot more money for maintenance? I think Yellow Springs is not unlike any other school district. I wonder if I mentioned Centerville and Oakwood, but I think somewhere in my head is that schools are supposed to spend 2.5% of their assessed valuation each year on, on maintenance, and nobody can do that. So a million dollars a year for Yellow Springs schools is catastrophic. Your budget right now, if I'm remembering, is $5 million? Uh, over, well, uh, okay, is it um, literally a bunch of sheets of I mean, I think the whole school is about 12 Totally. Okay. total budget, nine and salaries. I mean, this is operating and yeah, um, awesome. teacher salaries, and health insurance, and everything. Oh, yeah. and Should it be more than two hundred thousand? Yes. Okay. So realistically, can it be a million? I, I, I. Well, if you look at the math, right? If you're collecting a million or one point five, as you say, the million was just for the high school. That blows away what the levy was, right? It's mean, fifteen right. no levy. It's three times the cost to the last. Right. Yes. yes. So I mean, it, it would be significant. But I think it's it's in line with things we've been talking about as a right. group is address the maintenance and and I guess it's a question I don't know for who um, we've got a, a maintenance person is that similar to a project manager is that somebody just fixing okay no so no it's I mean that, that's is exactly it a full time program manager yes, yeah. right. 
Uh, and, and I don't know that his number, the 200,000, I don't know where he got those from. And I, I'll, I was trying to search my mail. Uh, well, we have, the, we have the actual permanent approval levy. Yeah. yeah, no, I understand. Talk about the but, regular day to day. But, but, but I think that we spend significantly more. Okay. And, and Mario released those numbers. Um, and I think you, you know, this was back during the levy, so I was trying to find the actual number of mail. I mean, you know, for instance, we had $58,000 per grant to just repair the roof on the shoebox this year. And we have a quote for 260000 to repair to replace the roof on just the shoebox if that was uh, some, the route we wanted to go as opposed to just a minor repair to the point. So when you add it all up, Mario had a huge add up over the last 10 years of what the maintenance uh, bill was. I think that the 200000 is is the permanent improvement levy, but it's not. You know, we spent a lot more on maintenance than just that for year two. So I can see what I can get as that list. I was, was going to say, find it from you, the levy, you get it, or get, get it from the board, yeah. um, from the board office of what we've been paying because it, it's you know, it, it's not quite exactly just that. I did want to address what you brought up. Um, for me, I looked at the Fanning Howey report as a data point. Um, with David's comments, I take that as a data point. Right? Me too. And, and I, I think they're experts in certain areas, but not the whole thing. Um, and I think if, as long as we um, critically think through this problem and the data sources that we're getting, I think we'll make good judgments. I guess I, I'm gonna rescind what I said before. Going through this list right now may be of limited value, um, other than maybe deciding what I did last night was go through and try to figure out, do I agree with where it's categorized? Um, and then there were some things like, do we really need to upgrade CAT5 to CAT6? Is there really 10 gigabytes of memory going, or uh, data going through the school system? Because that's more than the Air Force Base is going through. But maybe it is, I don't know. I mean, it's just some things that pop up. But. I would hate for the school to have the Air Force network. Why? <laughs> just to throw that in. They just got to 10 gigabytes. We do have another, in an office, we do have another expert in the room. We do. Can we ask his opinion on what you heard? Sure. Oh, from what I just heard? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was uh, obviously a person who was interested and willing to do a lot of their work to help. I think it was informative. Um, something he did bring up was something I mentioned in, in past meetings was there were actually maintenance plan advisors. There are people who do that. They can, like, let's say you say, we want to spend, we want to up our PI levy from 200000 to 750000 and that's what we're going to have a year. The higher maintenance plan advisor to essentially map out everything he was talking about. So it's like going to that roofer and saying, what's going to happen with these roofs and these segments, plus all the other components of your maintenance plan. There's people who can build that for you. Um, I think he might have mentioned that. Well. Yeah. yeah, he did mention it, and I didn't yeah, feel like it was right to ask him what he thought about that. But he, he, he expressed that in one of his letters to the editor yeah. that we needed to, uh, his words were, uh, uh, find a maintenance consultant. Yeah. Figures are approximate and should be further evaluated by a maintenance consultant. And that, that person might be different than the, the individual yeah. we saw about the project manager. So the project the manager. on the day to day stuff? Yeah, they can execute yeah. the plan and get all the prices and pull it together. So I thought that was, um, that was right on. Um, I don't know about the, some of the value and judgments about like, what he's saying is like, it's, some, it's really easy to make something ugly look good. <laughs> I was writing some of this down. <laughs> Um, it was, he just had a really interesting perspective on things. So. If I can go back to the perspective, like what, what you brought up about, there are aspects to this that we need to take into consideration that we don't know about. So having your perspective, the school perspective, um, your perspective, our perspective, and Dave's, I mean, like you're saying, it's all the data points, and the more we have, without going right. on board, the, the more success will help us. I mean, I think right. that's kind of a no-brainer for us to move forward successfully. Well, Not that one perspective is the only way to go, but how do we really challenge our thinking critically and know the best way to go? And that's why we followed up the Fanny Hammer presentation with Mike's presentation, right? And why makes sense to indicative because because he, yeah, the more data points we have, the more likely we are to succeed. And do we have anybody on staff that would you know, in either position as maintenance uh, advisor or the project manager? Well, so I'm saying is, is I think that we kind of fill it now, and, and you know, we keep saying that that's not happening, but nobody I don't think is really expected to pick. 
that okay. is exactly the role that's he fills. Yeah. yeah. So why um, would we create? I mean, it, and that's what he goes into the building. Oh, the retired, but there's also Fred um, Conrad. Conrad. That's it. Conrad. Conrad. He's oh, the retiree. Right. He might be able to bring on. Although <laughs> I don't know. I think yeah. he's kind of done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, Fred Conrad is the current maintenance guy. Yeah. He actually, in the same capacity as Craig Conrad, is the current maintenance guy. Yeah. 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 Ye
That, I thought that was pretty funny too. But there ended up being a lot, lot of that going on. Yeah, yeah there, there was, there was a lot of that really weird stuff. Okay. Oh, it was a definition of the way critical is defined in priorities. So, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that it? Okay. I guess the issue too is if you change, my, my issue with some of these were like the roof, you want to wait until you have the outer line of the building finalized, right? If they were going to do a, an add on or an addition, maybe you do it all at once. That was where the phasing I was trying to figure out because they were talking about if you did the sprinkler system, you would need the power generator. If that was considered critical, the sprinklers were. It, so it was very yeah, confusing. It was, it's a, all it's a huge a, challenge. Yeah, you know, why does it say that technology is critical? I, uh, that's what one thing I don't, I don't know. If that's I would consider more Which, like the roof yeah, critical no than uh -huh. Uh -huh. we yeah, need the Wi-Fi faster internet. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It must be a different spreadsheet than this one. Yeah. No, it's, it's up here under the priority category. Yeah, wait, and it's better. Oh, right. right. Well, I just saw it. Right. 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 Number one, critical life of teachers. Okay. 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 Anybody come up with, as I said, there were, there were like, I found the omission of not addressing the modular at Hill's Lawn, but they were so, so strong about the modular at high school. So that was an omission I found. And then I also had that question of when you're talking about plumbing things, did it really address the, the back sewage backups and things like that we experienced? What questions and or omissions did you guys find? I had a question under the plumbing HVAC. Is that how you say HVAC? It is. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so where it says classroom unit ventilators, uh, and then they explain it. The existing uh -huh. heating only classroom unit ventilators. Are those the big boxes that are over by the windows? Yes. That only, who said yes? Yes, they are. The only person who knows that. Okay. All right. Because the air conditioning units also let heat out of them, I think. They also, but yeah, I've always thought they needed to be replaced. I just wanted to. I actually think there's breathing issues that come because I don't know that they clean them and they've been there, they're really old. Um, uh, so I just want to make sure that's what we were talking about. Um, they suggest, and they put that under priority, $600,000. Yeah. I'm hearing people saying they're cold. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we did cool off one so one thing I want to share, we allocate $200,000 maintenance-wise. Approximately 10 or 15 years ago, we would hire Summer Health to help with the maintenance issue. But generally, they were student workers, so two to three student workers that we utilized during the summer to help Craig Conrad at the time. And we no longer do that. And I'm just wondering, just thinking back to the thing that's where you've been around long enough to remember the student work that we hired in the summer. So what ends up happening is that our custodial staff, they sometimes do some maintenance work. However, because of the bargaining agreement, custodians are custodians, they're not maintenance people. So from a personnel standpoint, I'm just putting that out there that when um, David mentioned that we're behind, 10, 15, 20 years ago, there were extra bodies to help during the summer with some of those maintenance items that we have an employee to utilize for help for 10, 15 years. Wow. Has that been in your tenure, TJ, that we've had um, some workers? Uh, no, it's not. No. Any of you on that list? Do you know what that been happening, or do you have any insight into why? Uh, I don't know why, but I would say probably 10 years ago. Craig Connor had a fire about 10 years ago, so don't know why. It's just his choice. Oh, they know. did paint kids. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. At least three kids. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. High school age. Yeah, strong ones. <laughs> I got a couple of consent numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so do you, do you want me to take these massive spreadsheets and then re redo them for you so that it's all of the critical items in one long list and all of the priority items in one long list and all of the 
you know, we'll never get to them items in one long list. <laughs> hey, by now you waste your time on that one. Yeah. <laughs> would, would, that, would that be helpful? So, so we give us, you know, because right now I, I find it a little bit disconcerting to go from, you know, the number one thing on the list is actually a, a, a later item. Right. You mean, well, um, so do we, do we want to, I guess the question would be, do we like the categories maybe, What's a, right? Uh, the critical the priority and the, maybe there's three categories, but they haven't broken down by um, life safety code, technology, uh, like Ian said, and security. Um, and we might that, not, we, what we had <laughs> talked about in, in our, our um, guiding principles was safety was definitely important and security sure. was definitely mm -hmm. important, yeah. but I don't think we prioritize technology as number, as number one. Right. Um, what about code? Are we discussing that idea of code? You know, Mike and or, or Terry, um, what David was saying about code, about bringing things up to code mm -hmm. as a, a reason for doing something, it is, was he accurate in what he said about the fact that when we built it, it was built to code? What about Mike's probably a better codes? person than yeah. yeah, I mean, technically, yes. Mm -hmm. He's right. I'm uh, guessing that the handrails installed back when the tower was built were per code and it was authorized, but now it doesn't mean code. Um, so he says, he feels better if that's called a safety item, unless um, the handrails. But I, I will say, up to code is not um, necessarily a bad thing. For example, you know, there's outside air requirements now for being up to code, which means a building has to bring in a certain amount of outside air uh, to to your classroom. Mm -hmm. That needs to be filtered. And is that is that a good thing? Well, it's probably a good thing from a, a health and human. Um, experience. <laughs> what about fire? So, yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's changing all the time. Um, the fire alarms now have the, the built in emergency voice override. So, in an active shooter situation, someone can come on and provide voice commands from the fire alarm versus just the sound of creating the confusion and so forth. So, so the, code, the codes changing are to make things better and safer. Um, so just because something is up to code, I don't take that necessarily as a bad thing. What about like an ADA? Um, like I, I know, like our high school building, we have an elevator in it, but we have a uh, student and we will have more in wheelchairs and the accessibility uh, is sometimes an issue yeah. um, for various things. And isn't that a law that requires things to be accessible? Could you have to, there is a law that uh, there should be equal access and someone could sue for compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you've got a case where you actually have the music room that's down instead of right. with no ramp. Right. Theoretically, mm -hmm. you would have to provide a, an accessible route to that music room to meet, to meet that. I guess, Mel, regarding your question, would it be necessary to reorder everything like you suggested, or do we just go through and look first at what they have as critical and go through it and decide what we think is critical or not? Maybe then recategorize it or something. I yeah. could I could switch it around and just put all the criticals first, and you know, just just start changing yeah. the sequencing there. But, but caveating what you said, I don't know that I have the expertise to say, oh, that's not critical. Right. Or well, that one's more critical than that one. So. I mean, I mean, I'm not dissuading that we shouldn't look at them that way, but I don't have the expertise to see those. Yeah, to say, no, that's not critical. And it sounds like, based on what Mike was saying, when we say we're coming up to code compliance, that actually does get into the health and safety arena. Mm -hmm. So so that does fit into our guiding principles and we're looking for health and safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me health and safety is the number one thing we have to focus on. Mm -hmm. Technology, I mean, right. we have to, I mean, those things have to be the first things we're going to address. Now, do I know which one? Is critical which one is a priority? Not really. But they've, uh, we'll look at this one and we're on the HVAC list just because that's where um, uh, Denver right. sent me. The first thing up there is the lack of a sprinkler system. Right. Um, again, looking at Mike and or Terry, uh, how critical is it that we don't have a sprinkler system today? I, I'm going to defer, defer to the architect if I'm charged with the safety of. Students and adults in the building, in my mind, it's critical. In, in all of this, there are so many safety regulations that are just rolling out mm -hmm. um, for schools from the state. It's almost hard to keep up, but you know, who can speak to the actual specifics? Yeah, here's, yeah, here's the problem with sprinkler systems: is is it starts a cascading effect. So. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to run down, if I'm going to replace sprinkler piping in all the classrooms, well, I'm going to be replacing the ceiling. 
And if I'm going to replace the ceilings and I'm going to replace the lighting, and now all of a sudden a, I don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but now all of a sudden a three hundred thousand dollars sprinkler line item is actually a two, a two million dollar <laughs> ceiling um, line, and then it's like, well, if I'm replacing the ceiling, should we be dressing HVAC at the same time because my ceilings are now? You see what it kind of cascades. Um, yeah. So, so I say sprinkler is uh, is kind of a maybe. It's a maybe depending on if it if it forces you down a path that opens up re spending dollars on non-critical items. It's where it gets a little tricky. So it sounds to me, and this sounds you know, sort of got off of me too, but it sounds to me like with our level of expertise sitting around this table, we need Mike and Terry sitting at the table with us. Um, and we need to go through these one at a time to really understand. It's not like we can do this sitting at home at our, at our homes and say, I think this one is more important than that one. I, I think we actually have to go through these and say, mm -hmm. what do we think? Discuss. Just discuss. Well, even at another level, perhaps we should have someone with expertise, whether it's Mike, or Terry, or uh, Con, Con Craig, Craig prioritize it that way. I mean, you list all the critical ones, and then someone with the expertise says, yeah, this one's more critical than that. I mean, can I ask a quick question yeah. to TJ? Mm -hmm. TJ, how do you get, how, so the superintendent and the school board prioritize projects based on what criteria? Well, really it's been um, the superintendent working with the maintenance and then working with the treasurer, uh, you know, as a team kind of get together and, and decide, hey, this is the next big thing. This is when we can pay for it. Um, this is what's critical, this is what's not. I mean, we probably would have to bring in Craig and, and Right. Mario and if you've had Terry had a discussion with Mario about how they're doing that specifically to answer it fully, but then they bring it to the board if the expense is above a certain level. Right? I guess it's like thirty five or fifty K that the board has to approve. But Mario would always tell us about any expenses coming up, you know, even though they were a couple thousand just to just so, yeah, up. just a heads up, like this yeah. is gonna happen. This is I just wanted everybody to, to be aware. I'm like, okay, that's right. Heads up and it's a certain dollar amount we have to actually uh, approve it and that I would request if we could get the maintenance plan and, and that that would be helpful. That's, yeah, that's yeah. the part yeah. that's missing right now. Yeah, got the, it, as you said, like Maybe everybody's Craig commenting the side that there's no maintenance plan. Craig 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 Craig. And there is there is one. Yeah. Yeah. It would be delightful if Craig could help. Yeah. Sure, they have to. I I need that kind of, Okay, it's all great. Well, somebody said we might want to delegate the assessment of all these things to Terry and Craig and Mike. I, I don't know if. if if that makes sense, or if, we, if it makes sense for us to all to really understand. Because if we delegate it to them, then how do we understand what their thinking was as they were doing that? Can we be a part of the discussion? That's what I was thinking. You yeah. Know, we, what I about think, the technology guy? Do you need to bring in Tom? Yeah, I think you, we, we can bring in Tom. And, and I guess, I think what would be helpful is, and so if I'm the recommend something about technology, I, I need to provide some confidence too. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to go back to that example. This talk about do we need, you know, this high speed, but it's more than that. And I think we're right. in technology, we say classroom, but all of the district's financial data mm. runs across the lines. And there have been so many recent um, security issues with that, oh, yeah. with companies and yeah. schools. And so all of these things should be looked at in terms of is this a priority? Well, if we're talking about just you know a projector and a screen in a classroom, most people would say no. But if we're talking about communication of very sensitive um, financial and other data, then maybe yes, it does rise to the level of, of a critical concern. So I think whether it's about technology or the maintenance plan, any any type of context we bring to um, discussions, discussions, and and what we may or may not be recommending, I think that's always helpful. And Terry, as you say that, it reminds me that one of my concerns with the Penny Halley um, assessment was that it looked solely at the building and it didn't really listen to teacher needs. So, for example, I got so much information from that teacher focus group, Desiree, and I got so much information from the student focus groups that weren't reflected in what the assessment was. But was it reflected in the educational assessment? Was it really in the educational assessment either? Was it just talking about some specific classroom needs and things? So, so it's like there's another level of things in addition to, so back to the context, back to the context. So, um, so you said you're not going to be here July 3rd. 
I, I can I can be Peter. I'm going out of town, but I can eat just as easily eat from here. So. Oh, okay. Can we? Do you guys check with Thomas and Craig and see if they can be here July third? I think I think having, having all sure. of us sitting around the table, Thomas and, and, and if if they cannot, the, the next meeting or then yeah, you've got the list of meetings your turn. Not till July seventeenth. And right now we we really don't have much of anything in August because um, we have August twenty first, August seventh. There were lots of people who were missing. August 14th, I'm the one who's missing. Um, and um, then August 21st is the event before school, and Terry agreed that we should cancel that one. So we wouldn't have a meeting again until August 28th, which seems to me a long time. I, I was also thinking um, if we got through this and we're ready to have community meetings, maybe August would be a good time to have community meetings, but I'm not sure we're going to get through all this in time to have community meetings in August. Is it possible to do a different day? For yes, what I think I'm going to send an email out to people and see if we can get another yeah. date in August. We do at least have three in July, 17th, 31st. So that's helpful. Okay. Okay, so we have a plan. We are going to have informed conversations. We're going to... Who <laughs> <laughs> with people who know what we're talking about? Yeah. Um, we're still going to rely on John... Desiree, Ian, and, and Julia as people who are living day to day with what's going on in your different buildings. Mm -hmm. So, because again, you, you bring a, a different perspective than the engineers brought. So, we, you are part of those informed voices that we others sitting around the table are collecting data points from. Mm -hmm. One thing I really like what we just did by bringing this to Roach in uh, was that the maintenance idea was a very important idea that was expressed in the community objections to the levy. Over and over again. There are some other ideas that people who you know, voted against the levy raised, like one would be collaborating with area institutions, like with Antioch, for instance. Um, we, I think we used their tennis courts for the tennis yeah. team, and um, we have used the theater, and, and but we don't pay the theater, I don't think, uh, to use the theater. and. Uh, you know, just if we're going to establish, I, I think a community value is to collaborate with other institutions. So maybe that's worth some discussion sometime as well. Um, and I think there are other ideas, um, sustainability, environmental, um, uh, other kinds of objections that people have. Um, recycling. Um, this makes me think. Time to pull up the notes from. Garbage. Mm -hmm. I don't. Is that mm -hmm. Talking about the guiding principles. I am talking about the guiding principles. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, can, uh, just to clarify, Mel, that when we can get this uh, maintenance folks in, our goal is going to go. We go uh, line by item or line by line through the Excel spreadsheet, and regardless of what category it's in, and just say, hey, that this is, this is an about. immediate need due to maybe a, a maintenance issue that's not a safety issue, but something we have to address in the next three years, let's say. I mean, is that kind of what our criteria is, uh, one to three years? And then and then we have safety issues as well. And, that, and we're trying to get to a point where we have a good understanding of what the biggest problems are that we need to have money to address. Immediately. Okay. Didn't you also want to know and understand how they're doing it now? How they're yeah, yeah, yeah. assessing right. and prioritizing and what, what you already have bidding uh, out schedule. of contracts and what's scheduled. Maybe what's yeah. scheduled. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and what have been done in the past. Yeah. We should get this report long before the meeting. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I thought I lost it. Sorry. But yeah, that's what we want to get that understanding. And, and get their perspective also on do they agree with, with something is a one to three year versus a, um, a they might identify mm -hmm. things that are further out, they might identify things that they, Benny Howard said, were further out that need to be done more quickly. I know what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that past maintenance because that was mm -hmm. a huge issue. I've heard that over and over again. Mm -hmm. The past maintenance, mm -hmm. about the, the fact that there's been insufficient maintenance, that, or I should say, the perception that there has been an insufficient maintenance. Right. If we have the history of the maintenance that has been done, we can do some education on that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had included in here um, 
what came up in the different groups, and then I combined them, tried to categorize them together to say where we had overlaps and so on, and then I developed a draft for your improvement. Whoops. So my first thought on this is I think these guiding principles are really important. I felt like they need to be prioritized because I think right now it's just a list. Um, and then the question to me was, well, do we want to do like a, a weighted voting to try to decide on that? Or is that something we put out as a, a survey to the community to find out you know, what is the priority of the community on these issues, right? So maybe, I, maybe not exactly these seven, but that was my thought is, is that was us in a room spending about 20 minutes coming up with what we thought was important. Um, no deep dives. No deep dives, but also like, are, are we the ones making that decision or is that something, if we have a simple, you know, I mean, we did surveys before on past information. Could we provide some kind of get data from the community on where do these rack and stack um, in importance? Like, is affordability the most important? Is, you know, ongoing community engagement, you know, where do those fit? I took a stab at it, but I mean, I don't think that I'm, I'm not sure I or this group are the ones who should be making that that decision, or if that's even necessary with the way we're progressing. So. Do you think the community would do another survey monkey at this point, yeah. or maybe this is something we take to the focus groups? But I, I, I agree with what you're saying. We're not the ones to decide this, but yeah. to pull it up and and see what people see, think about. One thing we could do, since you're talking about priorities amongst our group, I could certainly do a survey amongst our group to have people write these and identify what we think it is. But I think your point about when we go to the community and start talking about how we came up with whatever our list of problems is, we say these are the guiding principles that we chose, that we followed in coming up with these, and um, use that as an opportunity to ask the community to weigh in are they the right guiding principles. Do you, you know, who prioritize health and safety is the number one? Do they think affordability is more important than health and safety? We can get that input. Because ultimately, as we go forward, we still have more decisions to make. Mm -hmm. um, so, so getting your input at that point in time certainly could be useful. For the first couple of meetings, I would think for sure. Does that make sense to you guys? So from a starting point, do those seven make sense to you? I was going to say we did a good job coming mm -hmm. that list. <laughs> I guess I, I kind of reached, I looked at it and I, I was a little bit confused as to space conducive to learning and design for 21st century skills. Those mm -hmm. seem to kind of blend together oh, right. a little bit. Um, I, had I just kept of, getting fewer is better than. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, um, I mean, I kind of, I, I had it broken down into health, safety, and security, which is what you have in number two. And I think I put safe environment. Uh, There's some things here. Uh, pet, pests and hazmat, air quality and HVAC, proper plumbing, building security and entry and cameras, so that's security. And then the last one was fire and tornado. You know, because we didn't, tornado was a big thing we talked about and we had not captured it there. Because um, I think those, I think that's a, number two is a really good category. I think there were some things from different places that could fit in. Um, the second one I had was the maintenance sustainment plan, which we talked a lot about today, um, kind of built into whatever plan we have. That's really critical. Um, affordability, the same sub bullets you have there. Um, design for 21st century skills, and that's where I kind of merged the space conducive to learning Beautiful. and the design 21st century skills. And then the last one was YS values, and that would be environmental suitability, healthy meals, community resource, you know, those kind of things. Um, I can see my list. I would, love it. I would love it. Anybody have any concerns with anything he said? Mm -mm. Kind of like the, okay. What was the first one you had? Okay, to kind of the first one was the health safety. That's what I thought. Okay, okay. Yeah. got it. No, that was, I like that. And I like what you added with health and safety. So what I will do is, between now and our next meeting, I will, I will incorporate his stuff, update this, but get a survey out to you guys so you can like order these things. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Modify 
guys are cool. Okay. Um, can we take a quick look at this proposal or on the back page of the agenda? Lori challenged me. Oh, flow. We're twelve. Oh, yeah. We are actively in the middle of figuring out what we understand and what we don't understand. As people said, you know, multiple data points are helping us get a richer understanding of what we need to do. Um, but I thought once we figure that out, then we are also sort of one and two are sort of working together. We'll be looking at our perspective on the priorities in terms of which you know, health and safety comes first and, and whatever else. So we can go back to the community and say, here are the biggest problems that we think need attention today. Here's what has been done in maintenance. Here's what is being done in maintenance. So we put that story in there as well. So it's not done in isolation. That we're coming in with a silver bullet that the school board wants to ever thinking of. Um, and the, number three is prepare for the community meetings. I really think we have to, since we're not all going to be at all community meetings, that's impossible for us. We have to be as totally consistent as we possibly can in what we say and how we say it and in how we collect the information from people. And I think we're all agreed that we, this is not a one-way street. This is a two-way street. We're going to tell them, here's our best understanding, but we need to hear from you. So um, that, that's why we are going to take time to prepare. We're not going to end up with, here's our list of, of recommended problems. Go forth and talk. We are going to prepare so we, not quite scripted out, but absolutely consistent when we talk to the community and listen to the community. Is there any thought of having any uh, proposals at that point? Two, three, four? Three options. Of, well, you know, what, before it, talking it, to the community, I mean, we, in, as in Mike vote, said, we had I don't know how many meetings we had before the levy. There's a stack of letters. Uh, we've done another survey. Well, I, this I is mean, why I wanted to point, discuss the flow because in this flow, oh. we're, we're we're having two sets of engagements with the community. One is to just get their understanding of the problems or share our understanding of the problems and get their agreement that those are the right problems to solve. Then we need to come back and say, so what are our solutions uh, to those? And that's when we would have proposals. Sure. Okay. So listen first. Listen, you know, if, if we think ABC is the number one priority, our number one priority in terms of problems to solve, and people come back and say, no, it's not, then there's no sense us putting a solution together for it. If we think something is a number five priority and they say, wait a minute, that's the most important thing to do, <laughs> we better have a solution for it. So that's why I'm thinking it's a two part community engagement process. One is the, the understanding of the problem, and the second is the understanding of the solution. So after we have the public meetings, we have to figure out, so what did we hear? Um, as we saw in the survey, we had people who said, the only thing I was mad about in the proposal was it didn't go far enough and tear all the buildings down. To people who said, you know, you guys are absolutely bonkers to think we could spend that much money. So, so we are going to have disparate, disparate perspectives coming back. So we have to sort through this and kind of figure out, so what do we, you know, what do we, think we hear the most of? And, and again, one of the reasons why I want to make sure we're prepared, we can't, we can't misunderstand the loudest voice with the most right. voices. Right. The majority. The majority. Mm -hmm. Because it's too easy. One person can easily dominate things, and all of a sudden, right. you don't hear anything. And so you have 20 people in the room, and one person thought one thing, 19 people thought something else, but you never heard from the 19. Are so, we going to have a moderator for those, or are you going to do it? I'm sure somebody's going to moderate. I, I will be no, at as many as I can. Yeah. I have to talk to these guys about, you know, my contract because we're already way, <laughs> way bigger than than when Mario and I initially discussed it back in December. Um, but it, I, I would, I, I think it would be beneficial if I were at as many because at least mm -hmm. that's also one common, mm -hmm. one right. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, so first round of community conversations, understanding the problem, getting their perspective on what they think is important. We come back, we distill what we hear, then we start working on solutions. So if this is the problem, what we think is the best way to go? Clearly we heard from David, there are lots of ways to go. You know, there's not one, one um, solution, so that's why we still have conversations about what the solutions are. Then again, we're going to do preparation. When we have our, our packages of solutions, packages of possibilities, you know, one year, two year, three year, whatever it turns out to be, because I have no idea at this point in time, we go back and share it with the community and say, is this making sense to you? Is this, you know, what in here would you support? Is there anything in here you would not support? And we come back and distill what we heard, and then we can make a recommendation to the board about how to go forward. So that's my current thinking on how this will go overall. Do you have questions or improvements? 
And at this point in time, I certainly want to open it up to Terry and TJ, <laughs> since you will be the consumers of this ultimate mm -hmm. thing. So I hate to say to all of you, you know, we've, we've got meetings planned out through September. We're going to be going further into the future. I think we need to. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean, it's an involved process, and we can't do it with, you know, four or five months of work. It wouldn't seem. Well, you know, the, the school board did two years of work the last time. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that how well it was recognized or understood. and. and mm -hmm. And it wasn't a big task force like this per se, right? Which is why we're trying this approach this time to get more voices into it. But you know, there was a lot of late work that Mario did, and uh, I do think it's kind of ironic that Chad brought up. Are we going to bring options out? Well, that's exactly what Mario did last <laughs> time. He was criticized for doing that, and now we're talking about doing the same. So it's one of those things where it's it's a it's a very active and involved community, which is why I love it. And why it's challenging in my house with the hair. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a process. It is, it's a process. Well, and that's why I'm a little concerned about, I mean, I agree we need community input, but weighing just, uh, you like guys did do a lot. There were a lot of me. Yeah. There are a lot of meetings. There are nine there are a whole seven meetings, and then there are the pulse meetings nine. after those meetings. People still said we didn't. And, I, and that is that's something I did. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so now I feel like there has been some input, like, and if we can gather and we try to gather that, I just worry that uh, what are we going to get, and how much additional information are we going to? Gathering the, the validity of that sample size, I guess, uh, from these these, these uh, community input meetings. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah the validity of, of, of that size of, of turnout and how, that is going to guide us. I just worry about that a little bit. I mean, that's what, why this, I think, yeah. this group I don't think you get a lot of consensus of those meetings. You may hear really interesting things that you can build and, and incorporate, um, but typically the ones I sat through, there was very very little consensus, all the disparate voices and the loud voices really came up, and then that happens on Facebook as well. Well, the, the, one of the things that, that we are, had talked about doing differently was not necessarily just holding a public meeting, you know, here's a community mm -hmm. pulse meeting, but actually going out to different groups. And for example, John had provided us with a long list of different groups. Yeah. I, I think outreach is critical to us. You yeah. can't expect them to come to us. Mm -hmm. right. I think we have to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Chad and I talked to. about this. We have to impose not our will but we have to impose our visibility with those constituents that will not come to us mm -hmm. and so that's going to take a little bit we of grassroots work yeah we're gonna, i mean that's definitely down the road yeah. that's a really interesting phrase john i really like that not our will but our visibility yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's so that's one thing chad is is a, a little bit differently and and because of the size of our group we have the ability to do that where the smaller group didn't really have that ability to do it and the diversity of our group, you know, we have young people who can help us reach young people. Um, so, so we have the opportunity. Um, and I share your concern because I read through those, you know, I read through those survey results word for word for word, so I could do that analysis, and um, and it was it was hard to read um, um, many times because there, there was just a, there still remained a lot of animosity and 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 the, the diametrically opposed views. Right. We, we have to start with this understanding, whatever our solution is, we are, it's impossible for us to satisfy everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. but there, um, not so much the survey, I found it was instructive, but um, I spent some time reading the letters to the editor, both pro and con, and there are actually a lot of really good ideas that are shared. And I, I felt like the vast majority of the people who are against the levy actually had some really good concrete reasons. And uh, originally, I don't think we ever presented an option that was renovation. The, wasn't the option all of them just new buildings? No. So, it's, so yeah. you did have a renovation option. In fact, the final plan was was more renovation than oh, right. buildings. And, right. And, and that's, but it was all high school then, right? It was. High school, middle school. And, and so that's sort of the, the frustration I had in that process is that people, even today, still don't seem to understand you know what, what it was. And, and I don't even know how to best communicate that because I felt like I communicated over and over and over again. 
Um, but there was a lot of community input, and the plan changed remarkably, right? Mm -hmm. right. Whereas yes. the initial yes. thing was, yes. let's do a K-12 campus here in Mills Lawn. Yeah. And it was a very clear signal from that first mm -hmm. um, phone survey that we didn't want a K-12, mm -hmm. particularly here at this location. Mm -hmm. And so then the plan changed, and there was the idea of maybe we do a K-12 out there. It was a little more, more lukewarm. And then, so the, the final settlement for the last levy was, let's fix the middle school and the high school. Uh, there was no plan for Mills Lawn. You know, so felt like that was coming next, and there really wasn't a timeline. There was no like one, two sucker punch that anyone was going to pull. Um, but then we did change from all new construction to something that was a, a huge combination of part of eight and and uh, and fix, particularly the things that were like still the levy uh, that we were paying on uh, on a portion of the high school complex. So all of that was going to remain, and we were going to be fixing up. Uh, portions of it, and then just add, you know, take down the three-story building and the shoebox and, and rebuild some new, new facility in there too. So it was a combination of, of the whole thing. I should, I should probably notice, is that final plan on our, it's going to move here. Yeah, that's one that I might spoke on. Yeah, I did a lot of moving around in the Google Docs. Um, so we have um, the 2018 design document has, has all the mics design in there. I think my name is that meeting that might present it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think Tom, to the, Tom the tech guy, is trying to organize all that material yeah. for us. He's, he's trying to, he's trying to, actually what he's trying to work on is creating a public website. Uh-huh, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For all that information. So that is a way of reaching out to the public and people can access it. Yeah. Okay, anything else tonight? We certainly would have a little box paper from our, our uh, at home advisors here. Next meeting is July 3rd. Um, we will have Mike, Terry, if possible, Craig and Thomas, so we can start really understanding their perspective. Prior to that, uh, TK, you can get that maintenance information to us. Sure, yeah, I'll try. I swear I have it. Uh, yeah. Any questions, anybody? Thank you all. Good stuff. I think it's kind of a large group. Carlos came in for the So I think the allowed might be off.